Hello everyone, uh, thanks for abandoning coffee and uh, coming in to uh, have a look at the presentation. Um, it's got a bit of an obtuse title, um, you'll notice that is because my title is Dr. Johnny Wilkins, and if you're a doctor then you just by default have to do these things. Um, but really, that's actually what happened. But you can't make that the title because people don't like that. Um, so I asked the police about cybercrime uh, using their Freedom of Information Act, and um, I'll just talk you through why I asked, what I asked, and some of the results. Um, and then also some interesting insights into the Freedom of Information Act system itself. Okay, um, so this is large authentication, so that you make sure that it's actually me up here. Um, so my name is Johnny Wilkin, I'm a threat research manager in Alert Logic. Um, it's a Houston headquartered cybersecurity company, uh, but we have our research and uh, development and a couple of other functions in our, uh, our office in Belfast. So I did my MEng in electrical and electronic engineering in Queens um, a long time ago, and then I followed that on with a PhD thesis in Wi-Fi network security. So that's kind of how I got into the, the whole domain. Um, previously presented in across the world. Um, not sure how that's relevant, but they specifically asked about it in the big size presentation or the big size um, uh, application. So try to. So agenda. Um, we're going to go through the introduction of the agenda and then some information about the cyber protection uh, that we have in a minute, or just some context about what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about the FOI requests, uh, the results of analysis, then some abuse and defense, and then finally some takeaways and discussion. So uh, we're a little bit late, so um, I'll, I'll look to the organizers to tell me whenever I should be getting off, and then if whenever I need to get off, I'm going to storm through a couple of the last slides just to make sure I'm not uh, unduly affecting the rest of the guys. So, straight on in, cyber protection review. So, uh, the UK in terms of protecting itself, whatever really that means, um, from cyber threats. Okay, so that means the whole of the UK, right? That would mean everybody. When I say the UK, I imagine that's absolutely everyone. Um, but is our real is our cyber protection realistically covering all those different things? I mean, whenever you hear about breaches, whenever you hear about the money going into things, whenever you hear about um, government initiatives, it's usually oh. A uh, big company has been hacked, oh, yet again, um, somebody has left some vulnerability on a government website and somebody's got in, right? But realistically, when you're talking about the whole UK, surely that should be wherever you are, wherever you are, your level of cyber protection should increase. But well, that's UK level uh, protection. Um, but who protects the public, right? So we are the, we are the lowest role, essentially, right? Um, they're part of the UK, right? They, okay, uh, they consist of the entirety of the UK, so why don't we protect them? Now, Essentially, I'll talk you through where the thought process that I went through in order to get to even doing these FOI requests. So, say the average person, no, let's not say the average person, let's say the people in this room are breached, right? Let's presume that everybody in here is a cyber professional of some description. It's fine if you're not, you don't have to put your hand up. Um, what would you do, right? Say you were breached. You would probably go and you would have an academic or technical interest in it. You would go and you would mediate it, do whatever it is that it is you need to do in order to fix it. Done, right? So let's say your friend is breached, right? Now, maybe it's a good friend, maybe it's not. Maybe you care a little bit less than you would if it was you. You'd probably try and fix it. You probably wouldn't delve any deeper. You'd probably just say, just patch it, and it won't happen again. So, let's say the general public is breached, right? And they don't have us to call on. Who does, or the person they do have to call on is some script kitty who has no idea what he's doing, right? What do those guys do, right? What do they do, right? Now, I would imagine, and this is where this comes through, they would go to the local police. Because generally speaking, the average general public would say, mm, okay, I think a crime has been committed here. Who do I go to report crimes that have been committed? I'll go to the local police. Now, say that person does go to the local police. What happens, right? Are the local police prepared? Are they not prepared? Will they help them? Will they not help them? What happens, right? So that was essentially the, the mechanism through which I arrived here. Now, um, this happened in 2012, and as a result, uh, I asked for information for 2011 to 2012. Yeah, um, and I didn't really know a lot about the UK national infrastructure, so I did some digging in terms of at that time around 2012. What have we got? To my eternal surprise, they had a plan. As far as I'm aware, it was the first plan they had in 2011, but it was never. Um, and it was called the UK Cyber Security Strategy: Protecting and Promoting the UK in the Digital World in November 2011. Okay, great. Now, with all the open <laughs> documents, that is a riveting read. Um, but essentially, I'll break it down into the four things that are worthwhile coming out of it. They had four high level objectives, and they said, okay, we're going to secure UK cyberspace, and we're going to do these four things. One of which, make the UK one of the most secure places in the world to do business. Super, I talked to business, right? It's not to do with the public, but yeah, that sounds good. 
Uh, UK may are able to resist attacks on national infrastructure. That's definitely important, right? Whether it's important to talk with the public, but yeah, super. Open, stable, and vibrant cyberspace. Yeah, great, right? It's not about protection, but certainly. Uh, UK have the necessary knowledge to excel at cybersecurity. Okay, well, that might cover sort of local police and then the public, right? That kind of sounds a little bit like education, but it's going to fit anywhere, it'll fit under that. So I thought about each of those in, uh, each of those in turn about how they would uh, reflect upon either the public or small to medium businesses, right? So I expanded them a little bit because say you're say you're a government department, there are, some people care if you're breached, right? If you own a local co-op or you have you know four shops around, say you're Buju, say everybody cares about Buju. So. Um, if they're targeted, who cares, right? Small to medium business. Now they should be covered under this to do business SMEs, right? Now SMEs are disproportionately targeted, and the reason they're disproportionately targeted, and I hope I'm not saying this to anybody who doesn't know this, um, is because they have less resources in order to apply to cybersecurity, and there's many more of them. So generally speaking, if you're doing some sort of scan or you're doing some sort of uh, whatever, right, you're likely to find just open IP addresses that have some raft of vulnerabilities that are open the SME because they don't actually have the resources to defend these things. Um, so, say you're an SME, you get breached, and they report their local police, what happens? What happens, right? That was essentially what I got to. Um, now, they also said the UK should be better able to resist cyber attacks against national infrastructure. We all think power stations. Now, our home broadband, not national infrastructure, right? We all have that in our homes, that's however many tens of millions. Is that not important to protect, right? Say when employees go home, we're all cyber professionals, right? Say the, say the HR person goes home, or the exec or whatever department goes home, and then they get breached at home through their own broadband because there's some vulnerability and some neck here, blah, 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 that's 10 years old that they put in. Who cares, right? Who did they report it to? They don't. Do they go to the, do they go to the company? Maybe, they're not going to help. What can they do? They're supposed to go to the local place, right? Then they also said there should be an open, stable, and vibrant cyberspace. I didn't really have any much that I could say about that. Um, I don't really know who this is, but um, she doesn't look very, uh, she looks pretty evil. Um, then you have, UK have the necessary knowledge to excel at cybersecurity. Um, again, surely local police fall under that. So, that led me to freedom of information requests, right? Bit of a jump, bit of a jump there. Now, at this time I was a postdoc in Queens, and I got angry during the rant, and then I thought, you know what, I can actually do something about this, because I'm a postdoc in Queens, I can do whatever I want. Um, so then, the UK Freedom of Information Act. Now, this gives people the right to access recorded information held by public sector organisations. Right, so that's the purpose of it. It's actually one of those few times whenever the UK government said we're going to be more transparent and then actually were. So it's worth a pointing that out for that reason alone. Um, generally speaking, it's used to arbitrarily poke around um, for some dirty laundry. You'll find it all, up, uh, all uh, across the newspapers because that's how they go and find out this information. Um, but it can be useful for us. And that's one of the outcomes from this is that if you want to find out things about how cybersecurity is applied in practice in government, this is one way you can do it, rather than wait for reports and whatever else. They do actually have to apply these things. So, um, some examples of some freedom of information requests that have been put through to police, because again, this is, uh, this is well, I'm talking specifically about the uh, requests of the police. Um, are there more Polish people in the bad years in Sheffield and Mallet? Actually, of course, Sheffield and Mallet is. Um, that's not reported. Super. I would be surprised if the police had any, uh, any, any record of that. Another one, how many bonsai trees have been stolen in the last five years? The answer is 12. Super, right? So you're tracking the number of bonsai trees stolen. That's an important factor that I will be coming back to. How many UFO sightings have been called in? I'm not sure what's to do with the police, but there were four. Um, that's nice to know. How many crimes have involved clowns? One, and he was the victim of a beating. <laughs> <laughs> I call that justice. <laughs> um, so, FY requests can be sent by sent to any public body in the UK. Again, within the context of this, I'm going to, I'm talk, I'm going to be talking about police constabularies, but you can send it to anyone, right? Uh, it has to be public interest information, you can't ask about private matters of people. Uh, must be obtained from existing systems, another important factor, they can't have to go out and, uh, and find any information that's not already there. Um, and we're not requiring more than 18 hours of administrative effort to acquire. Again, these are all limits, will be important, we'll come back to them. Uh, these are the rules. So, um, generally those are the rules that I said, right, uh, I have to co come up with a couple of questions. Um, so I come up with 10 questions, which seven are addressing, I'm only going to talk about seven. Um, to each of the 51 police constabularies in the UK, I only got responses from 37. Again, we're going to talk about all of this. Um, the purpose of it was to determine how public and small businesses, that's why I'm talking about SMEs, uh, report crime to the local police, i.e. do they. Right? So all the stuff beforehand that I've talked about was supposition. I believe that blah, blah, blah would happen. Let's see if there's any evidence on it. 
Um, so how are they handled if they are reported? And what is the library cyber, level of cyber expertise? Um, but again, uh, uh, yeah, those are questions. The reporting period was November 2011 to November 2012. This is important as well because we're now 2016. So FY request details. I tested earlier and I hope everybody in the back can read this, but I'll, I'll quickly read it out anyway. Um, so one, how many reports were from A, the public, and B, the business community, where demons recorded offences on the remit of the Computer Misuse Act? Now, there are many acts that things could conceivably be covered under, but as you'll see later in terms of the results I got, it was at least relevant, right? And again, if we come back to the 18 hours, um, if I say, please give it to me from all these nine acts, well, then that takes nine times as long, and they might come back and say, that takes too long, we're not going to answer it. So there's a bit of scoping in there. Of these reports, essentially, how many were deemed worthy of further investigation? So I'll try to put down the chain of how many were reported, how many do you actually look at? Then the third one is how many of these were passed to the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, for consideration of prosecution. Now at that stage, that's handed over, and I would have to go and talk to the CPS to find out, okay, what actually happened with that thing, right? Um, so that's that stage is outside of the scope of this, but that was the point of the three questions, to see how many, uh, as it goes through those gates. Um, and again, I'm referring back to uh, the UK Cybersecurity Strategy 2011, which I mentioned at the start. The reason I mentioned that is that it's specifically required um, in 4.31 uh, that the UK local police forces recruit cyber specials. And again, cyber specials is intention, of course, um, with skills related to investigation of cyber crimes. So, okay, we're a year later, how many of you hired? Yes, um, well, the reports in question one, I'm not going to read through this, we'll talk about it later, but essentially split it up into different categories. Talk about the categories later. Uh, how many crimes were reported by social media? Of these, how many were further investigated? Again, this is 2011, just in 2012. Of the reports in question one, were any of them using an online reporting method? Right. Um, yeah. Never mind just social media. Did somebody said email you for kind of capture of them. So those are the requests. I sent those to 51 consignories with a time frame of saying, please give me all these answers, November 2011 to November 2012. And this is what I got. I'll give you, I'll just give you the answers and then we'll talk a little bit of an analysis of each one as we go forward. So 51 requests, uh, 37 responses. So that's not a great response rate. Um, five give additional information. Five forces are so good that they just went, you know what, here's a big data shell, here's additional stuff that we could never even ask for, what we think will be useful. Love those guys. Uh, 14 said the data was not organized. I'll be referencing this constantly. They know how many bonds I traded stolen. However, they can't tell me how many crimes were reported um, under cyber, uh, under this particular cyber legislation. That's suspicious. Um, the average days to respond is 33. So that's the average days to respond is 33. It took them on average a month to do this, to find 18 hours to do it. Probably means they're just really busy. Uh, again, on the right-hand side, we'll be coming back to these again as well. Um, six said that there were full national security tactics exemptions. So um, they said, nope, that's a matter of national security. We're not going to answer any of your questions. Funny that six said that, and there were 37 that said, no, actually, we, we can get more information. I wonder what the six are doing, this is so secret. Uh, there were nine and a partial, so again, there were, well, there were 10 questions, and within that, some of them said, well, we can give you the answers to one, seven, and six, we're not going to give you the answer to the rest, right? Again, why? Other people are giving me the full answers, but sure, at least, at least you should. Um, number of responses with that was 19. Uh, so the percentage of forces responding was only 34%. That's not a great number. Uh, however, the reason I'm pointing that out is that this is not this is not statistics, this is not something you can go, okay, well this is representative of da, 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 da. This is useful in terms of point examples. It's a relatively small sample set, you have to take your rigorous statistics hat off and then picture, oh that's interesting, I find um, And then the cost of these requests, in theory, as a maximum, um, is 27,540 pounds. And we'll come back to that way at the end. And yeah, this is a essentially the average request responses to each of the questions. Again, where it's relevant, we'll call this back out, but all of the impressions these slides will be shared, and then if people want them, at least all the information is there. Um, you'll notice that question four and question <coughs> six are zero. Um, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that question four is the cyber specials, um, so that's a little disappointing. And then the key five is one broken up into different, uh, different categories. Again, we'll talk about a lot there. So, question one. Uh, on average, forces experience twice as many reports from people as from businesses. Okay, so that's essentially what this demonstrates. Um, it was about double. Now, again, you have to take your rigorous hat off and say, okay, that's maybe indicative of that background. Um, so we could be low sample size. However, 
if we if we project that out, then we could say, okay, so however many are projected, uh, however many are reported for businesses, we could expect twice as many to be affecting the public. Okay, that that that's interesting. That's useful. That's actually enough to to, to go and try something to go do something about this. Um, what is that? So one of the more helpful constabularies, as I said, took a big shovel and said, have extra data, uh, give me this. Well, give me the data for this. Um, and essentially, they gave me all the reports from 2005 up to 2012, which shows essentially a linear progression as we go up from 20 in 2005, went to, well, it was actually 100 and, well, that is like 105 um, in 2012, showing an upward trend. So not only are we seeing that there are twice as many to the public as opposed to businesses, we're also seeing that there's an upward trend of people reporting things to local police, or at least again in this one instance. Question, yeah? Would it not be fair to say that a lot of businesses keep quiet because the damage it might actually do to their reputation? <coughs> they brush it under the carpet because a lot of them would be small to medium enterprises. Therefore, they actually keep quiet in case they've got out and they've lost faith in their business or their products or them as a business. Uh, they could do, yes. That could be one reason for a lower point. I've no data to indicate one way or the other, but perhaps. Um, so, yes, we're demonstrating there that it's actually going up. People are reporting more year on year to local police forces to say, you know what, I have a, a crime that is related to some sort of cyber event. Okay, that, that's useful to know too. People are doing it more. It's not just that a couple of people are doing it and it's static, it's going up. Um, yeah, evidence of per force increase over time. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a dash. Uh, question two: Ninety percent of the reports from the local forces have enough information to warrant further uh, further investigation. Okay, that's good. So the things that people are reporting to the police, the police take on board and then say, okay, ninety percent of the time that's worthwhile. Don't know what the ten percent are asking about, but ninety percent that's a pretty big number. Uh, however, once you ask, once you then uh, talk about how many were passed for prosecution, it drops to fifty percent. So of the people that are presenting, uh, hey, I have experienced a crime, ninety percent. But then only 50% of those are worthwhile actually saying, okay, can you please go investigate the CPS? So, 50%, right? Good, bad. Um, again, all the way past the CPS. So, again, data shovel. Uh, constabular, one constabulary presented unusually helpful additional details. And they broke it down by exactly how uh, the reports that were presented them were resolved. Um, and again, this is one worthwhile account. So we have caution, charge, youth reprimand, restorative resolution, undetected, no crime. Restorative resolution, don't know what that means, maybe just put the data back. Uh, but yeah, the important thing to remember there is that you have the number there under caution, and then the 46 in there, well, I say 46, look at the pie charts, about a quarter, um, are there for no crime, right? So that's interesting that a whole quarter of them are, are no crime. I wonder why people are reporting things that predict this one particular design already again. It's important to reiterate that. Um, uh, that there's no crime committed. Now, I wonder why that might be. Um, generally speaking, the way this is treated in the public is whatever is legal in, in real life is also legal in cyberspace, right? Does that really hold up? Is that enough if it's a, a solid quarter or there isn't actually a crime there? I'm not sure what you're telling me that. What was um, the geographical implication of that? I would have to go and look that up. Maybe was it the financial area of London? <laughs> no crime of that. No, it definitely wasn't there. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that later. It definitely wasn't there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, some of these are going to be, uh, they're going to have analogies in online, they're not going to have them online, or offline, right? So for example, what would be the offline equivalent of malware, right? Some monkey jumps out of an Amazon box and locks your house and says, I'm not going to let you back in in case you give me a picture or peanut. I don't know, right? How can you actually describe the public appropriately? This is actually a crime in cyberspace. This might not actually have an equivalent in real life. You're going to have to remember something new rather than just theft to theft. Undetected is also an interesting category. Um, so we have those crimes where the evidence was not attributed to a suspect. Again, you can make estimations of that as to whether or not we're actually gathering enough information. Maybe we should be gathering more information, um, and then we should be using that in order to detect these crimes. Um, oh dear, she appeared. Um, now, this shows a kind of request to pass the local police, um, and if they were actually resolved or not. Um, oh yeah, sorry, this is the next one. Yeah, that's also a great set. So we've got some more added details. Again, some police facilities were super helpful and gave me exact examples of some crimes that were reported to them um, from, it doesn't break it, uh, oh yeah, well, essentially you can work on it if it's SME or if it's local uh, or public. So I presume everybody in the back can read again, but I'll read it out just in the options. 
So the first one there is retailers take to someone access their computer software um, and a website, change coding to alter the price of gift vouchers, essentially bring it down from 2K to 1P, the goods were not dispatched. So in that instance, the attack was not successful. However, a crime was not committed. That is a crime, and that's why it's going to the police. He noticed it was undetected. Uh, and the second one, a retail victim uh, had an order placed on the website for whatever, but it was changed down to 1P. Turns out this was actually a fault in WorldPay, um, not actually in the retail victim himself. And again, they worked this out, didn't cancel the order, but that's still a crime. That is still something he's attempted. It's unsuccessful, but it's still a crime. Third one, uh, offender logged into ex employer's computer remotely from home and formatted the hard drive um, of the computer to leaving data. Lack of a caution, don't do that again. Uh, number four, uh, offender hacked into the computer system to the company with the intention to disrupt their business operations. They got a summons, right? But that guy just got in, evidently, and they got a summons. The guy who deleted all the data just got a caution, don't do that again. Um, unknown offender number five has accessed the agreed uh, Facebook account, changing passwords, altering content, whatever else. Again, got a caution. You'll note as well that that's social media, that happened in social media. Uh, then number six is offender being a schoolboy during the lesson at work at school, used a school computer to access the school network, uh, deleted files, had to poke around, um, tried to gain access to things we couldn't, but got a reprimand. That seems fair as a schoolboy. That's not going to um, so, those are examples, those are actual examples of things that report to the local police. So, like, let's, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the internals of them. So, uh, one and two were essentially programming errors being exploited. Now, hopefully, well, it doesn't really matter, but um, we have uh, examples in the Magento shoplift bug, right? For people who remember what that is, that's essentially a, 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 something very similar to what's happened in the previous ones. Now, this is evidently being used against small to medium businesses. We have demonstrable evidence that that is occurring. Right? Not, we weren't running the gentle, well, a middle of the but, um, So this is evidently happening in small to medium businesses. That's important to know, right? These people are actively being targeted by these things. Note too that the victim in number two was a victim by proxy. They were not vulnerable. One of their suppliers was vulnerable, okay? By right? the world pack. They ended up catching it, whatever else, but can anybody think of uh, another big company that was uh, attacked in the same way, target. Right? Again, by proxy, these people are also vulnerable. These vulnerabilities all exist within the small and medium business environment. Uh, they called the goods before they were dispatched, so it's successful. But still a crime. Um, five and six are interesting too because they are related to social media. Note that the report of crimes for which there's a basis in question six uh, of social media was zero. So there are crimes occurring in social media in 2011 to 2012, none of them are being reported that way. Right? We're 2016, most of the year are probably you know, Facebook friends with your local PSNI, right? uh, and as a result, you'll know that they're much more active on that now. 2011, nothing. Uh, it would also be hard not to classify our school systems as national, national infrastructure as well, of course. I mean, this is all publicly funded stuff. It sits in you know hundreds, thousands of, uh, of buildings across the country. I wonder how much money those guys got from the Cyber Protection Initiative in order to secure those things. I guess it's zero. And I've already said this, it's not the with an entire slide, cyber specialist result is zero. Um, in November 2011, they said, let's go hire these cyber specialists. A solid year later, the answer from everybody who answered back was, no, we haven't got any of those. That's, that's not that's a bit of confidence. Um, again, you're doing it over the course of a year, extrapolated across, there are only 37 that replied. Now, I've looked at the national expertise is available, this is important. There is national level stuff, so say uh, Starbucks gets hit, right? There's going to be a national level um, organization there in order to protect those people. Now, that's fine, but the whole point of having a difference between a national level and a local level of protection is that they actually deal with things on that level. So yes, there's a national protection. They, again, probably don't care about the small local police stuff. The local police are supposed to handle that stuff. Um, and yet, where does that sit in the priority list? Even if it was reported to them, I'm sure they're super busy. There's prior litigation. They say, okay, this world's pay breach uh, that happened for uh, some customer, or whatever that was. Is that anywhere near the top? Not so. Okay, uh, and then question five is essentially breaking it down by the type that was reported. Uh, there was nothing terribly shocking under this, in fairness, but it was worthwhile to point that out that they are actually seeing uh, results in these areas. So it was broken down by malware, theft of personal details, unauthorized computer access, threats to children, including bullying. Cyber fraud, anything to do with Wi Fi, uh, and then something other. Right? So, other is relatively large in there because lots of things probably fall under other, probably ones I dream of. But then you have things like malware, theft, whatever else. So, evidently, there are things that fall into those categories, are being reported within that computer use, uh, 
computer misuse act counter. And they are actually being levied against um, uh, the public and small businesses. These people need protection. And the relevant size of the categories is essentially just what I've said there, rather than numbers, it's a big pie chart. Access is the largest number. Um, that one's probably slightly smaller than what I would have thought, but, you know, hey-ho. Um, other fraud, whatever else. There's nothing shocking out of that. It's worth a lot point out that it is occurring um, in each of these categories. So, on to exclusions. Now, the, death, the UK government contributes to the DPIR report, um, and as a result, this is for businesses around the globe, and then it's anonymized, and they put out, of, okay, here is the cyber protection of the breaches that are occurring around the world. Good. Absolutely good. We should be contributing to that. However, that kind of information is the kind of stuff I've been asking for. So, if we're going to anonymize that and make that public through this vehicle, why not for your information, right? Um, I would attest that that information is exactly the same as the stuff I've been asking for, so that's a little bit, that's a little bit funny. Um, so, it's interesting to see, therefore, that at least half the respondents considered that at least some of their information was protected either by some sort of uh, police force uh, information exclusion or some sort of national security. And yet, others not only gave me all the answers, they actually handed me big shovels of extra data because they were being super helpful. So that's a bit funny. So I broke that out into across the UK, uh, and this is the reason I know that it wasn't in the financial of London, because you'll see there, there's a big black hole around there, around where London is. Um, now, again, we're breaking this down by different areas. So the places where you should go live are the blue ones, because they have no reports. They go, yes, we do track that thing. Nobody has actually been breaking reported it to us. Go live there, evidently you're most protected there. Uh, where you're at least, at least likely to be attacked there. And then there are areas where we did actually receive reports. Now that's largely Scotland. Well done Scotland, the Scottish are here. Well done. Uh, Northern Ireland as well. Yes. Um, the rest of the UK, not so good, right? So you've got the black areas are no information, literally didn't get back to me, right? Don't ask for all about this, they will literally not get back to you. Um, and then you also have places like Durham, uh, the red ones for security exemptions. So you might have to shudder at what's going on in there, that it's to do with national security as to whether or not some particular uh, member of the public of the breach. Uh, so yeah, this is essentially a, dis a description of across the whole UK, how are your police forces reporting um, and how are they uh, reacting to reports of cyber threats against the public and SMEs. So if they're not reporting it, if they're not uh, putting it together in any kind of database of inquiry, if they can tell us the number of bonsai trees but they don't know how many um, of the public have reported crimes, are they really taking cyber security seriously? So this is essentially what you need to consider. And that's <coughs> Again, I've already said there are national forces for this, um, but the whole point is you have local forces in order to address local problems. There's no point kicking everything up to the national infrastructure. That's not the point. So that's essentially the information that I got uh, from the Fever Information request. Um, but there is a little bit extra that I went into uh, in terms of thinking about how, how does this work. Now, as I said, I'm going, coming back to the cost of requests, which was 27540. Again, that was a theoretical answer. And how do we come across that? Uh, how do we come across that number? So one constabulary said that uh, the cost of freedom of information request is about thirty pound an hour. Right? Now, probably more in London, probably in SLS places, but let's take that as an average because it's the information we have. Um, and again, you have a maximum time of eighteen hours. Now that would then be eighteen times thirty would be five forty. In this case, I asked fifty-one constabularies. I presume that all of them used all of the time. Um, even if they decided, okay, we're going to go and have a look at that stuff and decide, no, we're not going to tell you about it, um, that would be 27,540. That's how I would reach that number. That is the maximum amount that, in theory, you can consume from the UK government by sending a single request. Now, all I had to do was send a relatively generic email with 51 email addresses, and you don't necessarily need to be a very devious mind to work out what you can conceivably do here. So, let's just walk through the thought process here as, as we go along. Um, these can start very accept submissions by email, any email. Any email at all. Um, the email has to be correspondable. Sometimes they ask questions about, but oh, that's not clear, whatever else. So they need, to be able to, they need to actually be able to contact you again. Otherwise, I might as well just kick it entirely. Um, and neither the identity of the requester nor the motivation of the requester is considered or necessary. That sounds pretty much like no authentication right there. So this is likely intentional. The whole point of the Freedom of Information Act is to allow people to go and find, what, find out about information. But that's all very noble, but it also leaves it open to abuse. So really all you need to do is write a very short script um, using a basic template, uh, vary a couple of parameters in there, send off a series of, email, series of emails to whatever body you feel like harassing. Um, and then I've done police constabularies, but it can be anyone. Right? Then it's not 51, it's the maximum. Pick up hospitals, civil service departments, educational boards, whatever it is that you want, anything at all. 
So let's put this together in a process flow. So you select some sort of question template, generate some sort of identity. You're probably going to need to tell them your name. It's more than to believe it's an actual thing, right? So you can put together surnames and forenames, write them as you see fit. Um, you've got a couple of email addresses you're going to need. Generate a couple of temporary email addresses. It's not very hard to do. Um, generate some sort of topic, a generic topic. I would like to know the number of all of that. Doesn't matter what it is, right? On the topic of crime, healthcare, environmental, social, whatever it is that you want. Um, ask about the impact of it. You know, what is the cost? What is the staffing? What is the expertise? What is the training? This goes on. It's entirely up to your imagination how far this goes down. Um, some sort of offset to the current date. Um, you can ask for every six months, individual requests for every six months for the last five years. They will consider every single one of those on their merits and go on to individual requests for them. In fact, because it's broken down by 18 hours, if you segment it further and further down, in theory, I could have back to the guys who said, no, that'll take too long, segmented it down into six months, three months, whatever, and then that, in theory, would have made it easier for those guys in order to actually produce results. And again, that uses up their time. Then select your target emails, police forces, hospital trusts, Whatever you want, all of them. Uh, and then send, right? All you have to do is put this together. For ones that are rejected out of hand, fine. But for all of these things, you're going to send to a large number of people. And then that's going to consume a lot of resources. Now, there are two conditions that you have to meet within here, right? This is not entirely, um, I haven't entirely done this with I thought. Um, two conditions. Uh, they have to fall follow one of these two things. Either the information requested is exempt from disclosure, we'll talk about this specifically. Or the request is considered nuisance, unreasonable, or repeated. So let's take this over. Has to be so. For something to be exempt from disclosure, it has to be at least partially compiled. They actually have to get the data in order for this to occur, right? The reason for this is they have to perform a thing called a harm test, where they say, okay, well, we've got the data and we've had a look at it. Here are the positives of telling you about it. Here are the negatives of telling you about it. We're going to sign with the negative in this, sorry, right? And whenever some of the ones that did give me. Um, Answers that said no, we're not going to give you the information. Give the breakdown of this hard text, right? So we know this is occurring. Now, in this instance, we don't get the data. But if we're going to carry out this particular kind of resource consumption attack, we actually don't care. We don't care about the data. You can throw the data wherever you want. What we want is for people to go and spend their time and money doing things, and that's it. Right? So as long as it isn't immediately rejected from being exempt, then some damage has been done. It might not be the maximum, it could be the maximum, but it will be something. It's greater than zero. Um, some other areas, uh, areas to avoid. Don't make it to an individual. They'll reject that. Uh, and make sure it isn't national security or police force. You can't ask about things in that nature. They'll just go, no, that's obviously not something I'm going to tell you about. So the three ones that are more interesting for us, right? If it's repeated, if it's a nuisance, unreasonable, or repeated. So repeated is easy to describe, at least. Um, essentially, is it in the public domain already? You can't make repeated requests for the same thing. Now, you can change the time frame. And in theory, that would be different. But you can't ask for the same thing. Difficult to script that. There is a specific site that you can go to to find out the list of the wall. You'd have to parse that. Maybe it's difficult. I probably don't care a lot. Um, is it unreasonable? I.e., is it going to exceed the 18 hours? But even in that instance, they have to do some sort of assessment of the data to begin with. And as I said, you can segment this down into per month if you're so if you see fit. Now, nuisance is exactly what we're doing. Now, in theory, things should be rejected by that. But are you going to categorize something as nuisance specifically? Um, now, any individual police force might be able to work out that this is suspicious. And again, I sent it to 51 individual ones, right? So it has to be each request is sent to an individual body. Um, and then, as a result, each individual body would have to independently identify that there's a pattern here and go, hang on a minute, that seems like it's scripted. Um, I'm not going to answer that question. That seems to be something that's unlikely to be the job description of the people who are assessing uh, freedom of information requests. But due to not the skills, maybe this one pattern. But this still has to happen 51 individual times. And I only did the police. Again, however many email addresses you can find out, hundreds send them all. Like, there's wasting huge amounts of time. So, what things they could conceivably look for? Similarities of request source, email or IP, um, the use of a template, a repetition of certain key text, time interval between submissions. This is essentially spam, right? But what there is no spam filter in order to work this out. It's a person sitting there going, oh, I think this might be spam. The fact that spam is still a thing indicates that people are not very good at working out what a spam is not. Um, now, why would somebody do this? In fairness, why does anybody do anything on the internet? Both to control things or just to see if it works. You can also do it for hacktivism. The important thing to remember is that this is open to anyone anywhere in order to do. You don't have to be a member of the UK. There's no check to say, oh, somebody in the UK is asking for this, we'll give them the answer. Somebody in wherever you want, just constantly hit the FOI request system with garbage stuff. They'll have to assess the whole thing. That consumes UK national resources. 
it can, in theory, depends, it's entirely up to you how many you send, whatever it sends, it could be uh, hundreds of thousands of people, more. So, in theory, you can do all these things, how do you defend against it? Um, so we have an FOI system that is intentionally unauthenticated. The whole point is to allow people to ask for whatever they want in order to keep the government in check, or mostly to talk around very long. Um, this gives people greater access to data, but any defense that you put in place is going to erode that. So essentially, I'm not going to talk about these in any great detail, but essentially we have the current system, which is probably the easiest access you can imagine. Right? Unless you just make everything public all the time, this is the easiest way to do it. Now, anything other than that, to get, make it more secure, will have additional cost. And we'll actually we'll make it more resistant to the attack, but it's going to be more difficult to access it. So, if we talk about linking requests to identity as one thing, uh, detection software essentially spam as the second, and then we've got central organization as the last one. So, identities. What you could do is link to something as simple as Facebook, right? Now, like you could generate multiple Facebook accounts. Uh, it would make it more difficult to do, but you could still do it, but it would make it harder at least. Um, or you could tie in an official identity. Like, Many times, whenever you're logging into the government systems, you can't actually go in and authenticate using your whatever you want, your passport number. Um, probably not something you can use. Essentially, you can get an anonymous ID out of that, and you could link it into that. Right? And that already exists. It's something that could be implemented. However, that's going to cost money. Nothing costs nothing. In fact, given that it's a government, it will probably cost a ridiculously large amount of money. In order to do that, probably offset the cost of actually handling all the FOI requests. Um, to, 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 you can also require a response before the request is actioned. Um, again, you can still script that where you're so inclined, but you know, it, it, it would help. Um, or spam in terms of whether or not you're going to put that logic in the assessor level or the national level. Depends who you get to, uh, to assess it. Then finally, you've got a central FOI request office, which is probably the best way to do it. There are actually gen generally benefits to, uh, to me as a, as a public requesting information for this as well. Um, so the idea would be that you put it in a central uh, FY request system to be essentially a triage step. This triage person would look at it and then go, hmm, that sounds a bit suspicious, i.e. we go through spam filter or if it comes past something that sort of goes up, it would seem very familiar. Um, and that person could be well trained to spot these things. Plus it actually gives you the benefit of being able to say, please ask all the police constabularies this question, rather than me having to go dig around and find 51 individual email addresses, some of which were definitely wrong on the internet. Um, and then having to send it to each of them, communicate with each of them individually. You could actually just send one request, and that could spread it out, and that would be better for me as a person. Um, making these requests, it would also have greater protection. But, of course, cost, use of access, etc. Essentially, that's the end of it. Um, a couple of just takeaways of the stuff that I've talked about. The primary benefit of this talk in general is to demonstrate that actually you could use free information requests to find out useful information about cybersecurity. Right? I've asked a couple of questions. Whatever you think is worthwhile finding out about the government, just go and ask them. Free information request system would require writing up emails. That's essentially the highlight. Uh, public and the business, public and small and medium businesses are indeed reporting crimes to local constabularies. Again, that was a theory that I proposed at the start. It's demonstrably happening. Um, it's actually all right, but you've got uh, twice as much from the public as businesses based on this data. And again, you can't stick your statistical rigor hat off because of the sample size. Uh, for the time frame of questions, constabularies do not appear to have been very well resourced and then to investigate cyber crimes, they had zero people with specific cyber crime uh, knowledge, which was something that was mandated in the in the strategy, so well, that's not very good. Um, FY requests are authenticated and as a result you can do a resource consumption attack against them. You have to put into your mind to say exactly why somebody might do this thing, but remember as well, the person does not have to be a UK, uh, a member of the UK, a resident of the UK, somebody in Spain, somebody in Qatar. Whatever they want, to just send these across. Um, as a final addendum, because nobody's told me that I should have to stop talking at five minutes, um, it's actually finished. So the last time security strategy in 2011 finished in, coincidentally, 2016. As a result, you've got the, you've got the, uh, the results now of, oh, here's what we did. Right? Pleasure to really talk. Um, I don't really talk very much about it. But just that it is there, you can go find out there's a report of how well we did. Um, and then there's been significant progress toward reaching these goals. They say, this is, this is screenshotted, um, you'll notice that we have, we're actively attacking cybercrime. Well, 2011 to 2012 certainly wasn't, uh, certainly wasn't local well. And um, we're actively building our cyber skills and knowledge. I'd like to find out how many, uh, I'd like to find out how many uh, cyber specials that have won. And that's essentially it. Uh, time for some questions. Considering it's a uh, few.
few years now you know it moves on. Do you consider doing the same request again? Yeah, I think that would be interesting. Uh, I think just sending that off again and seeing if the answer is any different would be worthwhile, like, to be sent next year kind of thing. That would be good, uh, if we could find the time. I probably still have the email, so probably just to send again. Script at this time. Yeah, I could demonstrate that it occurred. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you, Johnny. Thanks for coming.